Good morning, I'm Jessica Lovell and welcome to the morning medical update. Cancer can be scary and on this program we love to highlight stories of hope and survival, but at the same time we cannot ignore reality. Yes, cancer does those death rates they've been dropping in the US, but it still kills hundreds of thousands of Americans every single year. And today we are meeting a patient who is radically honest and open about his terminal diagnosis. He has glioblastoma. It is an aggressive and deadly brain cancer. The median overall survival is 15 months, according to the National Brain Tumor Society. Some patients live longer, but around 93% do not survive past five years. Dr. Doug Burton is joining us here in our studio today. He was diagnosed with glioblastoma four months ago. Dr. Burton also happens to be a renowned spinal surgeon here at the University of Kansas Health System and across the nation. On the academic side, yeah, he recently stepped down as the chair of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at KU Medical Center, and he found also found the International Spine Study Group. He is the former president of the Federation of Spine Associations, and of course, we could continue on and on with his resume, um, but. Rest assured, you're a big deal, <laughs> and we love you. So we're so glad you're with us today, uh, sharing your personal story with us um, from a from a doctor and a patient perspective. We're also going to hear from Meredith Paulette. She is a nurse navigator working with brain tumor patients at the University of Kansas Cancer Center. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Good to have you sitting with us today. Dr. Burton, um, let's just start, to kind of get us up to where we are here this morning. When were you diagnosed? I was diagnosed on January uh, 4th. Tell us about what you were feeling up until then, and did this come out of the blue? Well, yeah, it certainly came out of the blue. I, probably around Thanksgiving, I started having a headache mm -hmm. uh, that would go away with ibuprofen, but it always came back. And, um, you know, like most physicians, I ignored it <laughs> for a while. Uh, but it, it, it wasn't going away. It was clear that something was going on. And so I uh, ended up uh, actually canceling an OR day and, and had an MRI uh, you, that January 4th. You'd popped enough ibuprofen just to say, you know what, something's up here. What do you mean by it? you're a doctor, so you ignored it? Because I think we have this perception that doctors know all. Um, the last thing they're going to do is let something slide. Tell us about yeah, that. Yeah, well, I think most of us ignore, ignore, ignore uh, mm -hmm. when it's ourselves. Uh, we're probably quick to focus on our patients and, and very slow to focus on ourselves. Put, put your patients first, family first, and oftentimes you all last. So, yeah. so tell us about treatment. Uh, we know this is a really <clears throat> aggressive type of brain tumor. Um, did you have surgery right away? Yeah, you know, I mean, I feel so fortunate for a lot of things. One of them is that I'm here mm -hmm. and uh, we've got a great cancer center and a wonderful uh, department of, of neurosurgery. And so I had uh, surgery with uh, Dr. Paul Camerata mm -hmm. on uh, January 9th and, you know, surgery just went as well as it could have. Uh, you know, we got what we call a gross total resection of the tumor um, and the post-operative course was uneventful and uh, then I, I started chemo and radiation, which is the standard treatment for this after surgery um, the, that first week of February. Uh, that was a six week course of chemo and radiation and, and now I've uh, started the, the next phase, which is uh, cycles of treatment of just chemotherapy. So were you surprised that you felt well enough to come back or is that just in your nature? Because uh, most people would think you just kind of take a step back, but I think who you are as someone who needs to be here. Yeah, you know, I I was fortunate in the, in the short period of time between my diagnosis and, and my surgery, I actually connected with an orthopedic spine surgeon at Brown University who has the same cancer. Uh, he was friends of a colleague or partners of a colleague. And I talked to him and he says, well, I'm back to work and I'm seeing patients. And, and I have to tell you, that gave me so much hope mm -hmm. uh, that, well, you know, I, I think I can still uh, do some of the things that I like to do for, for at least a while. And, and I think that that was my first uh, lesson in hope uh, with this diagnosis, but certainly not my last. So Doug, fr from the outside looking in, someone might feel like, this is hopeless um, if they were diagnosed with this. You've already said that you didn't feel that and coming back to back here really helped with that. But what does hope mean to you in this situation? Well, I mean, really, it's it's focusing on every day. Mm -hmm. um, I, I 
pretty early, you know, you, you do an accounting pretty quick when you're given a, a diagnosis like this where <coughs> they don't really give you any hope of cure. It's just hope of how long are you gonna live? Uh, and you could live a while or you could die pretty early. Uh, and, you know, the goal is to hang around as long as I can. Um, but what I realized is that really all we're guaranteed is today. And none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. And all of us are gonna face death. No one gets out of here alive. Uh, and so how are you gonna make the most of what you've got left. And um, that really for me is focus on every day, um, do the things you wanna do, the things you think you should do every day, and really not worry about tomorrow. I, I have really realized that I can't mourn the time that I don't, that I might not have. I don't know what that's gonna be. Uh, and focusing on that negative doesn't get me anywhere. You said right before we went on air, you said, oh, gosh, I'm just so fortunate. Where does that attitude come from? Well, I, I think that most of us are, are, I think many of us are more fortunate than, than we acknowledge. Mm -hmm. I'll start with that. And, and certainly I have had a, a blessed life and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, and, and everyone's situation is different, but you know, I'm, I'm able to go through this with a, with a wife and family that are tremendous and supportive. A great group of, of friends around me, and, and and an employer that has been has been really great to work with, and and you know that's not the case always. Yeah. You know, I I think about patients that might face this diagnosis by themselves, and and I just my heart goes out yeah. to them because I know how hard it is with that support. Uh, so I'm I'm very fortunate. So you're, you're a neurosurgeon, but you're also a super smart doctor. So orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic surgeon. Yeah. Orthopedic surgeon, yeah. um, but very smart nonetheless. <laughs> and so tell us a little bit smart about- enough, Smart enough, I guess. Smart enough, smart enough. To get through medical school. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> we'll take you. So tell us what glioblastoma is. Why is it so tough, tough to treat? Why is it so aggressive? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's the most common primary brain malignancy. Uh, I think 13,000 diagnoses a year but still fairly rare. So, you know, when you can, can compare it to breast cancer, or lung cancer, prostate, the numbers are small. Uh, so probably attention is a little smaller to it than some of these other cancers, as, as is appropriate. Uh, but, but this particular cancer, the big thing is that the way it grows, you can never get it all out. Uh, you know, when we think about cancer, we think, oh, we had margins, we got the whole tumor out, we got it. That never occurs with this. You just can't get it all out, and it's the brain. It's not like you're gonna go in there and just chunk out this huge bit of brain because then, you know, there's nothing left for you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, it, it's kind of that, you wanna be aggressive enough with the surgery, but you can't get everything out. And the way that it grows is these fingers and, and it's just, it's impossible to get it all out. How helpful is it though to be diagnosed early? Well, I think, uh, I think there's several areas where I'm very lucky. One of them is I was diagnosed before it had spread to both sides of my brain, or at least that we can see that it spread to both sides. Uh, and my primary tumor was in, in the back of my head in, in the vision center, and so my speech wasn't affected, my, my motor skills weren't affected. Um, and so that's really enabled me to still, I think, function at a very high level, uh, despite having had, a, you know, a, a, a brain surgery. Meredith, I want to bring you in because you're a nurse navigator, and just like your title says, you help patients navigate the very confusing world of healthcare, and in this case, cancer and, and brain tumors. So tell us about what it's like um, counseling these types of patients. Do you feel that you're there to lend that emotional support? And how so? Abs <clears throat> Excuse me, absolutely. Um, it's, it's an honor that patients feel comfortable opening up to me. And, and a brain tumor diagnosis is scary. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be there to listen, meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. um, 
inform them of, of the plan. I think that is tremendously helpful when people know what to expect um, and, and let them know that they're in the hands of a really great medical team. Yeah, I have a feeling you're a very, very important stop in their journey to make sure that you're helping them and, and being that resource for them. Uh, does it change the way you communicate with patients when they have a terminal diagnosis, something that cannot be cured? I don't, I don't think it does. Um, I think that every patient's situation is so unique to them. Um, and, and I really just, I, I want to meet them where they are mm -hmm. um, and validate their feelings um, and, and just continue to uh, provide resources uh, when when they need. And Meredith, I've got to say, I don't think we've ever had a physician on here that does not point straight to those nurse navigators and say, you guys are where it's at, right? Doug, would you agree? Oh, for sure. it, it, they're just there on the front yeah. line you, with them. You, you can't emphasize enough how important they are. The, the nurses uh, are what makes this thing go. Uh, and even you know, in my situation, the the, the nurses, while well, while I was in surgery, they were out talking to my family, communicating with my family. I, I mean, just we're you know, it's gold. It's yeah. it's amazing. What kind of questions do you get from patients and their families? A lot of patients want to know who's on my team, mm -hmm. um, who's going to be taking care of me and helping me attack this, fight this. Um, so we talk a lot about that. Um, and then patients oftentimes want to know, what does surgery look like? What does treatment look like? So we talk through kind of what to anticipate and, and who they can rely on. So you're really helping them understand the details behind what they've been told from kind of a higher level and you're yes. kind of breaking it down for the regular person and patient. I have, uh, doctor, I, I have a question for you as far as we talked about hope, but is it possible to, to be hopeful but also be realistic at the same time? How do, you, how do you blend those together? Well, you know, I think that, again, it's, it's living day by day. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's really what it's about. Um, you know, I'm not looking at like, well, in three years. No, I'm worrying about today and maybe this week and, and looking to the summer, but really I don't look much past that. I don't know what's going to happen then. Uh, but that's okay because th there's wonderful things going on right now. So, um, you know, I, you always have hope until the very end. I mean, you, you don't know. And, and you know, there's there's things out there that that we're we're looking at and, and striving for maybe treatments that that are you know not quite um, solidified as as you know successful yet. But yeah, we are talking about trials. And yeah, the, trials. The, have those played an important part in your hope? Well, for sure they are. Uh, you know, I think as long as there's there's something out there uh, that that maybe is different than than what the standard is, then you've got hope. Um, and, you know, I suppose at some point there will come a day that we say, well, you know, it hasn't worked and, and this is it. But, you know, I don't, I'm, I don't feel like I'm there yet. And so I'm hopeful that, you know, I'm going to be that lucky 1% that, that lasts longer than the odds say I should. And that's what we're, we're praying and hoping for too. Yeah. I, I know you said you're very fortunate and one of those, well actually what four of those reasons are Karen, Caroline, Natalie, and Jack. This is your beautiful wife, Karen. Um, talk about family for a bit for us. Well, I think it's, it's really every, it's been everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I couldn't have, you know, my life wouldn't be the same without you know my wife and my my three kids and and you know I feel so fortunate to have them and and just um, you know now they're young adults and you know their our goal has always been you know our kids are good people that are productive adults and I think that uh, by some miracle we've achieved that and and that in and of itself is is very fortunate and you took those photos what the day before you had surgery is yeah that right? well yeah so that was the day before surgery you know sc surgery scary even for somebody that's I don't know maybe done 5,000 surgeries in my lifetime when you're on the other end of the knife it's a different deal mm -hmm. and particularly you know with something like this so we thought you know we're gonna get some pictures while you know I'm still 
whole and you know then we'll see what we get afterwards and so that was uh, we, the the weather cooperated in January and we got some great pictures. Yeah, you sure did. Beautiful family. Thank I know you. they mean the world to you. Do you have advice for others who are facing a similar diagnosis? What would you tell them? Well, you know, I would, uh, I think that, you know, if you've got friends and family around you, lean into them. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that, uh, you know, you need to be at a place that does this and so you know again I was fortunate that this is my home base and it's, it's you know the best cancer center and you know hundreds of miles so um, really fortunate there and then you know I think that some whatever if you have some spirituality I'd lean into that too and I've, I've certainly relied on that uh, as, as I've embarked on this journey. What, what can the rest of us do? I know when I uh, picked up the phone and you and I talk, spoke on the phone a couple yeah, of days ago, it was yeah. one of the best phone calls I'd had in a long time. You were just so full of life and, and, and willing to share your story and I really appreciated that. Yeah. But what, what can the rest of us learn from, from this type of situation to maybe just better help, better be there for, for folks like yourself? Well, I think part of it is a little bit, you, you kind of never know what to say. Mm -hmm. And 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 everyone, you know, that, that goes through this has has their own perspective. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I've, I've tried to be really open and, and uh, able to communicate with my friends because they're all anxious. They're, they're grieving and they're anxious and they don't know what to say. Um, and you know, people reaching out really means a lot. So, you know, don't be afraid to do that. Uh, that's that's the, the, the support, the notes, the cards, the texts, the calls that I've gotten have really lifted me up, mm -hmm. lifted my family up. It means the world to us. And so I think some people are, are anxious and they're nervous about doing that. They don't want to bother, um, but you know, what, in whatever way you feel comfortable, reach out to your friend, your family member, let them know you're there. Uh, that, that means the world. So just treat you like the same old Doug from before? Well, I mean, you've got to, you're going to go at it with kid gloves. Right. You just don't it's, know. It's hard not but, to. But don't be afraid to reach out, I guess is my point. Good, good. Don't okay. be afraid to reach out. And I think a lot of a lot of friends and family are nervous about that. They, they, they are, they're worried about they'll say something wrong. Yes. I mean, I, I think people want, people love to hear from you. Okay, that's good to know. Really yeah. good advice because that's that's a question that we had. And Meredith, do you get questions from patients about end of life plans or what do I do now? It's something that comes out of the blue and you are not prepared for. Sometimes I do, mm -hmm. um, and and when patients ask about that, um, I often get them connected with our social work or our palliative care teams. Mm -hmm. They're experts in this sort of thing and can really um, inform patients what those logistics look like. Um, but my conversation with the patient is really just encouraging them and 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 letting them know that. Thinking about this in advance um, is is a really tremendous gift to their their friends and loved ones and families. So what, what can you add to that? Well, I, I think that's that's spot on. That you know, uh, if, you know, if you're if the question is before you find out, you know, before you're given the diagnosis, think about what what am I going to do, mm -hmm. and you need to make plans. And um, and and not only I'm not talking just financial plans, but you need to live your life in a way that, you know, if it's cut short, will you will you be okay with what you've done? Uh, you know, will you look back and say, you know what I, I wouldn't do it differently, or would you say, wow, if I knew I was only going to live to be 56, I would have done these things differently because you just don't know. You don't know. You don't know. Every day. Yep. What are you doing? What what plans do you have? You said you're looking forward to summer. What are you in the? Well, I mean, I, I'm gonna. My, my my kids are all close. My son graduates and he's moving back to Kansas City and he's got a job. So we'll have all of our kids, you know, within 30 miles of us, yeah. which will be great. Yeah. And uh, you know, we've got a couple of, of trips planned that 
we can navigate around chemo. So, um, you know, I, I think it's going to be a great summer. And you're working when you want to work and not when you yeah. want to work. Seeing and patients right. twice a week and, and working uh, with the with the new interim chair. And, and so that's, I'm, I'm working as much as I want to work, which uh, is is a great feeling. It's certainly different than the last 35 years. <laughs> I bet, I bet. <laughs> well, be sure to get your questions sent in to us. You can use the chat on YouTube or Facebook. You can tweet us or email us at the Medical News Network. Info is right there on your screen. Let's get a check on our COVID account with Dr. Dana Hawkinson. Yeah. Good morning, how Hi. are you? I'm good, good. it's a nice day. It's good to have Doug here, Isn't Dr. It? Burton. Yeah, it is. absolutely. Right now, 23 total cases in the hospital, nine active. We're down to that single digits, which is good. Unfortunately, two severe disease with two in the ICU, zero on the ventilator. So we know the COVID public health emergency ends today. You mm -hmm. had a great discussion yesterday on open mm -hmm. mics with Dr. Stites. Um, you were also making the rounds yesterday on the news mm -hmm. talking yeah. about tuberculosis. Mm -hmm. You were on KCTV5 because the Kansas uh, Health, health Department, Department of Health and the United Unified Government of KCK and yeah. Wyandotte County reported a cluster of TB cases. Mm -hmm. They say there is minimal risk to the public. Mm -hmm. So two questions, if there's minimal risk, why does the health department need to notify the public? and yeah. What should we know about these TB cases in uh, general? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a valid case for sure. But I think it's about being transparent. Um, this is one of the diseases that increased probably uh, with some help from the pandemic with the uh, lack of uh, public health infrastructure going to these other, uh, these other programs such as TB testing and treatment. Uh, but it is minimal risk to the general public. However, we know that TB, active tuberculosis, tuberculosis cases are increasing in the United States in 2022. There were about uh, 82 or 8,300 cases, which is up from 7,800 cases uh, the year before. So we know that the cases are increasing, um, but certainly we know spe specific communities around the country may have more than others. We know that um, in our community, we have typically seen several cases of active tubercul tuberculosis cases every year. Um, right now, what they are seeing, what the health departments have put out is that they've seen a cluster of cases in a smaller knit community. Yes, it is generally more difficult to get, certainly more difficult to get infected with tuberculosis compared to SARS-CoV-2. But I think it is a matter about being uh, transparent and just letting people understand that there are still um, other cases out there probably. And we know that in the United States, there are 13 million cases of latent tuberculosis as well. And so I think it also goes to uh, letting people know that it is very important to get tested for that. There are two major forms. Latent tuberculosis just means that you've seen the bacteria, you've been exposed to it, you are not contagious, you don't have disease from it. And it's really that active tuberculosis that we want to identify and treat and do that contact tracing so that we can stop further active cases. Although the risks are minimal now, we know that when you do have close-knit communities, when you have multi-generational housing or housing where there may be multiple people in there, it is very easy to spread. But it's more difficult to spread, say, if you are at a bar or restaurant, if you are in a, a public bathroom, you can't get it from shaking hands. Um, it is very difficult to get uh, and spread in that manner. But I think we need to understand that it can become a problem if it gets to places like um, places where a lot of people congregate settings, such as uh, prisons, jails, um, or uh, homeless shelters, uh, or even dormitories where there are just a lot of people who are living close together. So it is vitally important to keep the public aware, be transparent, and then do the diligence with identifying those active cases and doing the contact tracing. Any reporters with us today? All right, let's get to our community questions. Jeremy wants to know, did anything change in how you talk with your patients about their own diagnosis? Uh, just has it changed anything about the way you doctor? I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I've been accused of being pretty blunt uh, with my patients, and and so I, I don't think that I'm, I'm more more that way or less. Uh, I, I do know I'm more patient, uh, and uh, you know I'm I, I enjoy clinic more. Yeah, I really do. You do blunt but patient. Right. I like it. It's a good combo. <laughs> okay, so Isabel says she saw that glioblastoma abbreviated to GBM. What does the M stand for? Yeah, it's it's multiform, uh, so glioblastoma multiform, and I think that that 
Um, I'm not sure why they use that. I suspect it's because the, the disease is, is fairly heterogeneous. Some of it looks really aggressive. That was the case for me. Uh, there was an area that looked very aggressive and then there was some other tumor that they could see that didn't look aggressive. So it, it, not all of it's the same, which is again is part of why it's difficult to treat. Terry wants to know, are you just gonna keep working? Just keep working as long as I can. Uh -huh. I want to. I want to keep uh, coming in. I think I've. I've still got a lot to offer, and uh, you know, I. I enjoy it, and you know, that's certainly one of my plans. Is I want to do the things I enjoy doing, uh, and working's one of them. I've been blessed to be able to do what I've done, and and I want to keep doing it as long as I can. And Rachel wants to know just how's your family doing? How have they? How are they holding up? Well, it was it was tough at first. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the very you know the first week was fairly terrible um, but I as we've kind of gotten into it and we've all kind of wrapped our arms around this idea of you know we're gonna live for today mm -hmm. we're gonna focus on today uh, we're gonna be thankful for what we have uh, you know it's it's been all right I'm not gonna say it's been easy but yeah. it's been all right well I want to get today's takeaway and I'm gonna start with you and ask you just what do you want folks to take away from this conversation I think that people should know that if they or their loved one are facing a scary, maybe not so great cancer diagnosis, mm -hmm. um, they're, in, they're in the hands of a really good team here um, and that they should lean, lean on people who, who care about them. Meredith, thank you so much. Thank you just for being here, but also just the work you do with our patients. We know it's, it's so very, very important. Okay, All right, Dr. Doug Burton. What do you want folks to take away from today and from your story? Well, I, I'll echo what Meredith said is that, you know, I, I, I think the first part was I was here and, th and that's been so wonderful for, for us, the, the great care that we got here and, and continue to get here. And, and, you know, the other thing that I'll say is, you know, you, you be hopeful, be thankful mm -hmm. um, and, you know, enjoy today. Um, that's, you know, we, none of us are guaranteed tomorrow. Uh, so make sure you're, you're taking care of today. All right, love that. All right, you All right. stick around, you stick around. Dr. Hawkinson, yeah, what's the takeaway? I know you're so I glad think, he's here I, with I us. I think the takeaway is just thank you for being here, Doug. And I think to what he said, just, just living every day and condolences and, and thoughts and prayers to everybody and their families who are going through things right now or who have recently lost someone. Well, and you're right, when we have folks like this on our mm -hmm on here just makes us go out and if you yeah. if it's lost on you not to go out and live things different then you're missing the point and that's so. why we're here as well mm -hmm. and all of the medical teams to so try and get those things that we can treat get those treated absolutely all right doc hawk thank you so much all things hard is coming up at 10 a.m here's alexis del Cid with a preview good morning how are you Good morning, Jess. What a what a great program, really special today. And today on All Things Heart, we're talking about one of the things in life that's inevitable, and we're not talking about taxes. We're talking about menopause. And women, you've either been through it, you will go through it, or you're slogging through it right now. Early menopause can affect your heart. I think it's okay to ask for help, and it's okay to reach out, um, to not kind of suffer in silence. That's Amy. She and her doctors put together a plan to lower her future risks of heart issues based on what they saw in Amy's past. So we're going to tell you the things you need to look out for coming up at 10 a.m. That's when All Things Heart tackles menopause. So bring your questions, bring your comments. We will see you at 10 a.m. <laughs> Oh, Lord, I have no questions about that, Alexis. <laughs> I, this will be one of those phone's already hey, buzzing. Hey, Alexis, from, I, yeah. it, I, right? I, it, this is going to be one of those. I'm asking for a friend. So I'll be blowing right. up your phone, asking you all sorts of questions. <laughs> As all someone right. who couldn't Thank sleep you. last night because I was so hot, that I is, know. Hey, I get it. A great I show. get it. <laughs> 50s are fun, 50s are fun. All right, Alexis, thank you so much. And thank you, of course, to all of our guests for being with us today and our viewers for your questions. We'll see you back here tomorrow at eight. Coming up tomorrow on the Morning Medical Update. When a five-year-old developed yellow bumps on her skin, doctors accused her mother of not bathing her enough. The power of a second opinion discovered the real cause. I'm Jessica Lovell on the next Morning Medical Update, the rare, severe genetic problem and the life-saving treatment giving this family hope. Friday at 8 a.m. Subscribe to our Morning Medical Update and open mics with Dr. Stites podcast. Now everywhere podcasts are available.